So can you see me now? Okay. Okay. Yay. All right. Um, tech support let me down again. They told me I was good to go and I wasn't. But anyway, uh, let's uh, get started here. Thank you again for coming out in the rain. I really appreciate it. I discovered I have a leak dripping over top of my table here. Um, anyway, my name is Joyce. And I'm here today to tell you guys how to control squash bugs without having to resort to any kind of toxic products. Everything we do here at Marshall Grain is organic, if at all possible. And um, there are actually a number of ways that you can control squash bugs. First, I want to ask you guys a question, though. Which do you hate more? Squash bugs, squash vine borers, or tomato hornworms, okay? Tomato. tomato hornworms, what do you see? Vine borers, vine borers. Just <laughs> dead already, all of them are dead. Okay, she doesn't like any of them, all right. <laughs> so, um, one interesting thing about insects, these insects that we're talking about, and you, you kind of need to understand a little bit about them in order to know what to do when they when they arrive because um, uh, you want to make sure that you're treating for the right bug and sometimes uh, there's you know it, it's hard to tell which one you've got so by understanding a little bit more you can have a better idea of uh, what to do you can uh, you know get on top of it faster and all of that so um, so before uh, before I go any further, uh, I want to show a couple of pictures, and I'm going to hold these up to the camera, and then I'm going to pass them around so that you guys can get a closer look. But hopefully our uh, Facebook Live audience can see this picture here. And uh, the top one is the, the adult squash vine borer moth. The vine borer is in at the, the, vi the actual vine borer is the caterpillar stage of the moth. And so the second picture is a picture of the vine borer actually inside the um, stem of a, of a squash plant. So the vine borer starts out as a, um, as a moth, the, the adult moth is totally harmless. It doesn't really do anything. All it does is wait for your squash to come. <laughs> and then it, it lays its eggs and the rest is history. But anyway, the moth itself is pretty harmless. But obviously the, the larva is, is what damages the plant. And that's what, if you can prevent the adult moth from breeding, then you can stop the borer from hatching out and boring into your, your plant. So um, those are the, the two stages that you'll be dealing with when you have a squash problem is uh, trying to prevent the moth from propagating itself in the first place and then what to do after if you've, you know, if you miss that step for whatever reason, or if you just didn't catch all of them, what to do about the vine borer after it hatches out into the larva. So we're going to talk about that. And um, do y'all want to see this close up and personal? It's pretty gross. Uh, <laughs> and then the second thing is there's actually a totally separate insect called a squash bug which is more like a beetle it actually looks a lot like a stink bug i'm going to show you another picture of that this is this is the squash bug and uh if you've ever seen a stink bug they look a lot like stink bugs so that's one reason why you need to know what you're dealing with uh, and because you want to treat for squash bugs differently than you would treat for stink bugs and obviously you want to treat for vine borers differently than you would treat for squash bugs so it's important to be able to recognize these creatures and um, in this case the adult is the most harmful 
So you want to, again, try to keep them from propagating in the first place. And then if they do end up propagating on your plants, what do you do about it? So the adult, if it is successful in breeding, the adult is going to, thank you. The adult squash bug is first going to lay eggs that look kind of like this here, little clusters of bronze uh, eggs on the on the back side of the leaf of the plant. The squash vine borer actually lays their eggs on the base of the plant at the where the stems are starting to come out from the 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 trunk of the of the squash plant. So you're going to be looking in two different places, but these you're going to see on the leaves. And then when they first hatch out, they look. Uh, they come in a, actually, most insects go through a whole bunch of stages that they call instars, and they look different in each stage. Uh, but this particular stage is the nymph stage, and this is when you really start to see them. If you miss the eggs, this is like the next thing you're going to notice is these nymphs. So now they're on the front side of the leaf. Now they're all over your plant. Now they're trying to find the squash itself. And um, so they get, they get nasty right away. You don't have to, uh, you want to start worrying about them before they become an adult because they lay all these eggs and then they'll, they'll, um, uh, they can disappear into the soil and stuff. So we'll get to that as well. But I wanted to show you those pictures so that you have an idea of what they look like. And um, so the vine borers, as I said, are, are the larva of the moth. Um, the fancy name for the moth is Melita curcurbitae, or curcurbitae, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. <laughs> um, and uh, the adult female comes to the plant Here's a, here's a plant. So the adult female is going to come to the, the plant. And the yellow flowers are what initially attracts them. The, they, if, they're, if they haven't already found your yard by other means, then they're going to be flying around looking for this, this flower. And when they eggs here at the base of the stem like I was mentioning earlier. So they're gonna lay one egg at a time on each stem. So they don't lay as many eggs as, as the squash bugs do, but um, if you don't catch them before they hatch out, because as soon as they hatch out, they're gonna bore into the stem. So they're, you're gonna have one egg on each one of these joints here and uh, it's going to be ready to, you know, just pop into your squash plant as soon as that egg hatches. And uh, this is just, this one is a yellow squash, by the way. I uh, brought it because it's the one that's blooming. We, uh, we also have zucchini squash, which uh, you can, um, uh, you can't really tell the plants apart. You have to wait for the, for the fruit to form so you know what kind of squash you have. But um, we have these nice little sticks that tell us it's a zucchini. But um, since this one isn't flowering yet, it would, it's not really vulnerable. It's not vulnerable until it starts flowering. Yeah. And so that's when they're going to start arriving. So you want to get a, uh, on top of it before that happens. But um, let's see what else have I got here. Sorry, I need a... Um, so anyway, as I was saying, they, they um, lay their eggs on, those, um, on the stems themselves, and they're going to feed for about four to six weeks during the season. They're, they're not all going to hatch out on the same day, so it's going to be spread out a little bit. But um, once they have gotten into the stem, it's really, really difficult to do anything about it. And there, there are some things you can try, but first I'm gonna tell you how to prevent it in the first place. 
because that's really the best chance you have of, of dealing with it. And it's actually fairly easy to deal with vine borers um, uh, in the, you know, while they're still in that moth stage because we have these great squash vine borer traps that we've used ourselves here. We tested them last, last year out in our test garden. And um, I put out two of these squash vine borer traps. And the way they work basically is it's a sticky trap that folds up into a tent shape. And it has a lure which is, you can't really, you can sort of see it in the picture here. There's a little red plastic thing that carries the scent of the female vine borer moth. And so you bait the tent, sticky trapped uh, with, the, uh, with the lure, and that's going to draw in the males and hopefully kill all the males and there won't be anybody to, to breed with so the females will just die without being able to breed. And we, we did this last year and we must have caught, oh, 50 or at least 50 of those things that we put out two traps and I mean they were just jam packed with male squash vine borers. <laughs> So it worked really well. Uh, so um, anyway, that's your kind of your first line of defense is to do something like that. Um, and that works very well. The, um, it, it's totally non-toxic. Uh, it's all organic. It's not going to hurt you or your dog or anybody else. Uh, like I said, it's basically just a sticky trap. The thing that sets it apart from other sticky traps is that it uses that lure to draw in that specific insect. So you're not just getting a bunch of like bees and random, random insects stuck to it. Um, another strategy for it is um, one unique thing about both squash vine borers and squash bugs is that they each only lay one, uh, one batch of eggs per uh, per year and they tend to do that in the early spring so like March April uh, depending on you know the weather where you live and stuff like that but um, uh, for us it would be you know um, March April uh, possibly into May um, but um, basically it's going to be in the earlier part of the spring and so once they've laid those eggs, you don't have to worry there until fall about having squash bugs. So one strategy is to wait and plant your squash later in the season after they have come and gone. Or if you've had the squash bugs already, throw them out, dig them out, make sure you, you clean out any, um, anything that might harbor uh, you know, the insect over the winter, uh, clean out your bed, and then replant for the, a second season. And you should get a second crop without having to worry about them. So that's one strategy you can use. Um, so plant your first crop for them. <laughs> and then go from there. Um, but, um, and if you do get any infected plants, you definitely want to remove them, remove any, any um, dead leaves uh, or anything like that, um, even the roots of the plant, um, you know, clean out the bed as much as possible to get rid of any of that plant material. Because what they do is um, they can harbor, uh, they can live in the soil or like under a rock or under a, a board or um, in def sheltered places in your garden, they can live all the way through till the next spring when they'll try to lay their eggs again. And so you want to take away any possibility that, that there's still some uh, bugs in your yard, take away their, their um, hiding places, 
you know, so that you can minimize um, uh, having any of them stay over through the till the following year. So that's really important too. If you do get a vine borer, um, there's a, uh, one thing you can do is to try to remove the vine borer from the stem. And it's usually pretty obvious uh, when you have them. Um, again, the, you're looking for eggs both on the backs of the leaves and on the base of the plant. Um, and then um, if they do get into the vine, one thing you can do is to try to take a knife and very carefully slit, slit a stem, one of the stems, the stem that appears to be infected, slit, slide it carefully and slowly up toward the, toward the fruit end until you discover that where the, mo where the caterpillar is and then pull it out. And then once you pulled it out, um, bury that, um, bury what remains of that stem, mound some dirt over it, uh, and it will hopefully reroot and continue to produce zucchini or squash for you. So uh, that's one way to try to deal with the vine borers. Um, but one thing I should mention is that both the um, vine borers and the squash bugs, um, when they attack your plant, one of the things that happens is the plant, the stem and or the, the whole plant will look like it's wilting. And it's not because it needs water. Uh, if you know it's not because it need, needs water. Um, and uh, with the, uh, you know, with the squash bugs, you can see them. It's a little more obvious. But when they get on the plant, the, the squash bugs um, inject a toxin on, into the, the tissue of the plant that causes the plant to wilt. So, and then when the vine borer gets in the stem, that causes a wilting as well. So uh, that's why I said you need to be sure what you're treating before you uh, go too far, because if you're treating for the wrong insect, then you're still gonna lose the, the plant. So um, if you're not seeing squash bugs on the plant, then probably it's a vine borer. Um, if you've got, uh, you could have both, you know, but um, uh, if you're seeing uh, a lot of bugs on the plant, then that's the squash bug. And that you can you treat differently with um, sprays or uh, other things that you can use that I'll get to in just a minute. So um, I don't want to slit those because they're not infected and I don't want to... <laughs> I hate throwing away plants, <laughs> especially when they haven't had a chance to produce anything. But another option to draw in beneficial insects or release beneficial insects. Uh, some of them can be purchased, sorry, like our um, trichogramma wasps. And one thing I meant to mention too about the vine borers is once they're inside the stem, there's really no insecticide that's going to kill them. No organic one anyway. And I wouldn't want to use the ones that aren't because they would kill me too. Uh, but um, the, uh, once they're inside there, it, they're protected by the tissue of the plant. So spraying an insecticide, uh, even um, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is commonly used for caterpillar problems, doesn't really work. Uh, unless you try to do something like inject the the BT into the stem of the of the bud of the plant because um, uh, they're just so well protected once they're inside that that tube and so uh, we actually uh, don't recommend that you try BT unless you're going to inject it like that that would be the only way it, it would work. Uh, the other thing you can do is to release trichogramma wasps. And um, have any of you guys ever released 
wasps before. The trichogramma wasp is uh, specifically targets, um, it's, a, it's a parasitic moth that, that specifically targets caterpillars. And the adult trichogramma wasp is totally innocuous. All it does is fly around, drink nectar. When it's ready to lay its eggs, it finds a caterpillar and it lays its eggs on the back of the worm. So if you've ever seen a, a tomato hornworm with little white things on its back, that's because a parasitic wasp, there's more than one parasitic wasp that does that, but, but that's um, uh, what you're seeing are those white things that look like little grains of rice stuck to the moth are the um, are the eggs of the trichogramma wasp or the braconid wasp or wh whichever parasitic wasp it is that that got to it but that's an extremely effective way to control any kind of caterpillars uh, but again if the caterpillar is already inside uh, it's hard to uh, for this to work but it is you know if you put them out early there's a chance that you can uh, catch them before they get into the stem and so that's that's one possibility would be to try to do that uh, another thing is to attract would be um, the tachnid fly tachnid flies are another uh, beneficial insect most people don't think about flies as being beneficial because they're always you know buzzing around your head and trying to steal your hamburger and stuff. Um, but attachnid flies are really tiny little flies. And if, you're, if you spend a lot of time out in your garden and you're really looking closely at your flowers and, and stuff, you'll see little tiny flies out there. And most of those are beneficial insects that are gonna be helping you uh, po either pollinate your, your plants or um, prey on uh, another insect that, you know, another harmful insect. And tachnid flies are, again, like trichogramma wasps, um, the adult drinks nectar, so they're actually a pollinator. And then they, but they're parasitic, so they attack the um, squash bugs and the squash vine borers and um, uh, keep them under control. They are attracted to um, any kind of flowering plant that has uh, what they call an umbel type flower, which is like a, a bunch of little flowers um, together in a bunch uh, um, in kind of a flat uh, uh, pattern uh, rather than... Uh, like for example, pentas tend to form a, a ball, more of a, or a, more of a sphere shape. These are more of a flat uh, uh, bloom. Like uh, some examples would be dill, cilantro, um, agastache is an, another one for. But it's not an umbel, but it's a good companion plant. Uh, but um, cilantro, dill, uh, Queen Anne's lace. If you're familiar with that, the flowers on the Queen Anne's uh, lace, all that, um, a long stem with a whole bunch of white flowers on top, or not necessarily white, but um, those are the kind of flowers. So anything that, that has that type of flower would be attracting those, those beneficials into your yard. A uh, hyssop is another one. Uh, that will attract tachnid flies. Uh, this is the the agastache or the uh, hyssop. Uh, it doesn't have the flowers we were talking about, but it does draw them in for the nectar. And um, so that's a, this is another great one. Uh, nasturtium is another one, another great companion plant for squash bugs and squash vine borers that you want to have near uh, near your squash plants in your garden. And these also make a beautiful landscape plant. They come in a bunch of different colors. I just grabbed the purple one and blooms on it. Um, but we have some out there. 
Um, nasturtiums are also an edible, so they're a great thing to have in your vegetable garden along with your squash. And, um, and you can throw them in your salad or make other things with them. I'm not a cook, so I don't have a recipe list, but I've heard that they're good to eat. Um, and then again with squash bugs, um, you can get them confused with stink bugs. Um, and um, they can, again, both types, squash bugs and vine borers, can overwinter in your garden for the entire year. So take away their hiding places. Uh, they love to hide under any kind of debris piles. Um, uh, they won't go into your um, uh, compost pile because that will actually get too hot for them. If you're doing it right, uh, your, your inside of your um, uh, compost pile will get pretty hot. So usually uh, insects don't, don't hide in there. Um, but if you have like piles of leaves that you, you know, uh, just haven't raked up or whatever they can hide in there again under boards. They like tree stumps um, Sometimes they'll just get up against your house or even inside a shed or something like that um, And then um, they'll just stay there until the following spring uh, as soon as the weather gets warm enough for them they'll come out of their hibernation and start flying around looking for their yellow flowers again and then, um, um, let's see, I showed you the pictures of the squash bug eggs. So they're easy to see. that you can uh, control squash bugs is to just, if you see these on your plant, if you see the eggs like this, you can just scrape them off into, if you have a bucket of, uh, just make a bucket of, uh, soapy water and um, scrape them off right into the bucket and that will kill them without them ever hatching. Uh, you need to inspect your plants though one, if you see these once they start you need to inspect your plants like every day uh, because there are a lot of these things out there <laughs> and even though they only lay one clutch of eggs each each insect only lays one clutch of eggs but you know there's thousands of these out looking for your squash plant so you could have um, many of these show up over a period of time during the growing season uh, or during the breeding season so check your plants every day they hatch out really fast and you want to catch them before they hatch so so um, look for those on a daily basis and um, you can do the soapy water thing you can just squish them um, you can uh, some people suggest that you uh, at nighttime they go into the soil and uh, sleep in the soil so what you can do is put like a board or uh, uh, even just a newspaper on the ground next to your plant and during the night they'll congregate underneath that and then in the morning you can um, you know, before they wake up, <laughs> you want to uh, crush them <laughs> and get rid of them before they have a, a chance to do to wake up and do anything. Uh, and both the adults and the nymphs will, do, will congregate that way. So uh, that's actually can work pretty well as long as you. But again, you have to stay on top of it. You have to be doing this every day, every night, whatever, putting out your newspaper and or your board or whatever it is and catching them until you're sure that they're all gone. And, um, and then I think I mentioned too, the other thing you can do is wait until the second season. So we're blessed in Texas that we have two growing seasons <coughs> for squash the, in the spring and then the summer uh, that we can circumvent the squash bug problem that way. Uh, and then, um, you can also use uh, sprays, you know, and as a last resort, you can uh, use all kinds of different organic products to spray the adults. Um, the triple action is a combination of neem oil, 70% neem oil, and pyrethrin. And the pyrethrin is a nerve agent that's derived from chrysanthemums. And so when it 
hits the insect, it's a pretty fast kill. Um, it's, it sends their nervous system into uh, confusion <laughs> and, um, uh, and, it, and eventually kills them, usually within a, a couple minutes. Uh, and then the, if uh, the neem oil also coats them with an oil, so that helps to hold the pyrethrin on them and uh, then it also suffocates the insect. So they can't, they can't breathe and they've got, you know, their nervous system all screwed up. Um, you can also just use neem oil by itself, but I would recommend that if you do that, you use the 100% neem rather than the 70% neem. The 70% neem is uh, an extract, and what they've done is uh, some of the ingredients that help to kill the insect. And I'm not sure why they do this, but um, apparently it makes the product more economical for whatever reason. Um, but Basically, if you use the, the neem oil, the 100% neem oil would be a substitute for the triple action because it's got, um, it's basically replaced the ingredients that would be in the 100% neem with um, the, the pyrethrin. So was that clear to everybody? I don't know if that, that was clear because um, the, there's a product in 100% neem called azadaractin, I believe it's pronounced. Uh, and that's one of the things that they remove when they make 70. And so if you get the 100%, you're getting it with the azadaractin. And the azadaractin is the, is the quick killing part of the neem oil. And so that's an option. And then, of course, there's lots of ways to repel insects from your garden so they don't come into the, in the first place. Um, not just um, squash bugs and vine borers, but things like uh, cedar warrior will repel a wide variety of pests that you don't want on your vegetables. And it does it all naturally. All, this is a granular that you can spread on the ground, and it works for... Uh, depending on how much rain and, and so forth we get, which today it probably wouldn't last very long. Um, but it generally works for about 60 to 90 days. To, um, and it just gives off that aromatic cedar smell. And most insects don't like that. So that's how you can deter them that way. And then we also have the cedar oil in a liquid form. The nice thing about the liquid form is that you can spray your shrubs and trees with it and that will um, help deter like mosquitoes and things like that from hiding in your shrubbery. So let's see, what haven't I talked about? Oh, more companion plants. Did I mention tansies? Okay, I don't have, I didn't bring a picture of tansies, but they have a big ball shaped yellow flower um, uh, and it's a, a very popular it's very beautiful as a landscape plant, and it's also very good as an insect control plant. Great companion plant for your garden. Does a lot of different things. Hi, Frosty. I was wondering when you were going to show up. He's my, uh, he's my supervisor. And he <laughs> you want to say hello? Yeah, come on up and say hello to the live audience. There, yeah. This is Frosty. He's just one of our four store kitties. And he always has to be involved in every class we do. <laughs> so anyway, um, the final thing to do is crop rotation. And I know that's hard if you have, a, you know, a, just a normal house with a, a regular backyard. Uh, it's hard to get, um, you know, two separate areas or more, two or more areas that you can rotate your crops in because they really need to be um, you don't want to, you don't really want them to be right next to each other. Um, you really want them to be fairly far apart if possible. And if you have a small yard, that's, that's hard to do. Um, 
even with larger yards, you know, leaving open an area for you to rotate things can, can be a problem. So it's great for farmers that have, you know, a uh, thousand acres, but uh, it's kind of hard to do for residential gardeners. But if you can, that's, that's an important thing to try to do because there's all kinds of reasons to rotate your crops. Um, the bugs overwinter, fungus stays in the soil, bacteria stays in the soil, things like fire blight, and um, uh, a lot of different kinds of fungus uh, stay in the soil uh, all year round, and they need to be, uh, you need to plant in a different area just to keep those from continuously coming back over and over again. So anyway, um, again, prevention with both of these insects is really crucial because, uh, I mean, they can just, if you've ever tried to grow squash, you know how fast they can devour your plant. Um, they're, they really are as bad as tomato hornworms, I think, uh, because they're really, you know, a fast actor <laughs> as well. So prevention... Uh, make sure that you're uh, putting out traps or, or whatever you need to do, bringing in the beneficial insects, um, whatever you can do to prevent them from coming into your yard in the first place or at least from attacking your plants. So when they do show up, they get, you know, they get killed somehow or another. Um, and then um, use uh, companion plants, again, to repel or to attract the, the types of insects you want in your yard. And then using um, later, later planting schedule, planting later in the season, and then just monitoring your plants on a daily basis. Uh, you really, uh, if you're really an avid gardener, you're probably already doing that anyway, but a lot of people plant stuff and then they just kind of go like go on vacation <laughs> and they come back and they're like, oh, my plants died. Uh, <laughs> how come I didn't get any zucchini? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, if, you know, if I'm talking to you guys on Facebook out there, if you're that kind of person, <laughs> no offense, but, uh, you're really going to be, uh, better off if you're checking your plants on a, on a regular basis, because you're going to find all sorts of stuff you didn't know was out there that, that, you know, can either help or hurt your garden. And it sooner rather than later then you're going to have better a better success and a, a better crop yield and and um, all that kind of good stuff so that's it for my presentation do you guys have any questions yeah on the traps there if you put those out and it rains is that going to affect no because um the uh outside of the trap is waxed so, I mean, yeah, even if you threw it in a bucket of water, eventually it gets soggy. But uh, we left ours out all season. It got rained on it and, and stuff. Um, uh, our people water. When they water, they water everything, <laughs> including the stuff they're not supposed to water. So, um, yeah, they can stand up to getting wet. Um, maybe on a day like this, you might have a little more trouble, but... Um, they should hold up for the whole season. And the, like I said, they're waxed on the outside and then you're, you're folding it up into a tent shape. So the water shouldn't be able to leak in. Once it's deployed, the water shouldn't be able to leak in. It's possible for like, if it's rainy and windy, then it can maybe blow a little bit of water into the inside of the trap, but that shouldn't affect the lure or the um, stickiness uh, of the trap itself. And like I said, we had it out all season last year and um, it just caught a bunch <laughs> of vine borer moths. So, um, you know, again, you, can be, you should be checking it like everything else. You wanna check it, see if you're trapping, are you trapping them or not? Um, and, um, you know, if not, are they getting past the trap somehow? Or are they still getting into your plant? Uh, because they shouldn't. 
they should be going, the males should all be going into the traps. Then the, if it got too full and the sticky thing just wasn't, there wasn't enough stickiness left, um, you know, then, and that's why we sell uh, replacement lures is you can reuse the sticky traps if they're still in good condition. Um, it's, I don't think it's worth it. It's $15.99 for the lures, which are the main, uh, the main expense, you know, that's the, the thing that really makes it work. Um, but you can also buy, you get two in a package, a single package, and then we have 10 packs for avid gardeners that grow a lot more, a lot more plants. How big of an area should you put those in? How many do you I would put at least one on each plant. And um, uh, it says on here, um, what do they say on the, um, really? they can be found, by the way, on melons and cucumbers. Uh, that's kind of like their last choice. They'd, they'd much rather be on your squash. But if there's nothing else, they will go to melons and cucumbers. Um, but... Um, it says, it doesn't really say, uh, okay, for larger crops, deploy 15 feet apart. So, um, so if you just, I guess you could just do one or two traps in a, we put out two because there's two in a package, you know, and uh, we just had the one raised bed, but um, uh, it's saying here one trap for a small and then for a larger crops 15 feet apart. So it sounds like what they're saying is as long as your plants are, are you know, relatively close together, you can get away with one trap. Um, but if you've got like a whole row uh row garden then you'd want to have more uh so any other questions i'm mike um i have another one uh concerning the eggs mm -hmm. the other side of the leaf uh-huh if you're scraping them off and one of the eggs or two of the eggs let's say fall to the ground that's that's a danger yeah so will those they eggs, can still hatch out oh, yeah mm-hmm yeah, so you want to be careful if you're using that method that you get all the eggs in your bucket of insecticide. Okay. Um, and the, the sprays don't really work on eggs very well because, again, they're, they're protected by that shell, that outer shell. So um, the sprays don't really work on the eggs. They work better on the, on the nymphs and the adults. Um, but I've had times where I've planted squash and I've gone out there twice a day spraying triple action trying to keep to get them back under control because once they start hatching they're just they just won't stop until they've killed your garden yes sir are they main laying eggs at night or during the day well that's a good question I don't know um I would think that they're is at night at least the at night uh-huh yeah, yeah, the hawk moth yeah. is the tomato hornworm adult, and they do come out at night. And there are a lot of moths that are nocturnal. The army worm uh, adult moth is uh, is a night, um, nighttime, what do they call that, Di nocturnal? <laughs> Diurnal, yeah, nocturnal. Um, but you want to, in any case, you want to put them out... Um, you know, before they've, they hit your garden. So it's already deployed before they come into the garden because um, once they're there, you know, it's just a lot harder to, to deal with it. So, other questions? Okie dokie.